We respond to one name, and that name is? Jesus. That is the only name that we respond to. I want to be able to take you to Numbers chapter 21, and we're going to be reading verses 4 through 9. And I want to be able to bring this story to life. We've been on a sermon series that is called The Redemption Story. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. From the Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord set fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he will look at the bronze serpent and live. Today I want to speak to you with the subject in mind, healed from a snake bite. Healed from a snake bite. In order for me to get into the context of this scripture, I need to take you back to the original sin. We have covered week one, we have covered the original sin from Adam and Eve. And last week we covered the story of Noah. In the beginning, it was a serpent that manipulated his way into Adam and Eve to take a bite from the fruit. It wasn't the fruit that was poisonous. It was the choice made that was indifferent to what God said. According to Genesis 3.1, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal. Another description is that the serpent was cunning. One who is cunning is a professional liar. He is crafty and sneaky. Satan is a crafty, cunning, professional liar. His character is a rotten fruit. The Bible says in John 8, 44, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar. And the father of lies. You can't trust him. You can't believe him. It sounds logical. It sounds reasonable. It's convincing. But he will lure you in close enough to bite. He would convince you to take a bite. Adam and Eve made a choice to take a bite. And eat the lie. When you bite, you taste, and you swallow. And everything that you swallow, you start internalizing. It is now in you. They were manipulated and deceived by the one who characterized hate and pride, selfishness in his heart. He convinced Adam and Eve to eat. For if they eat from the tree of good and evil, they will not surely die. When you bite into the fruit, you are cutting into it. Scripture illustrates fruit as the makeup of one's character. We know the makeup of Satan's character is that he is a lie. That he is a rotten fruit. Your fruit is the matter, is a matter of the heart. Your fruit, what you expose, is a matter of the heart. The product of the fruit matters because the surface it may look appealing, but some fruit are just rotten on the inside. 
You take a bite into the fruit, it looks appealing, it looks good, it looks juicy, it looks white, ripe, it looks prepared, but when you bite into it, it's rotten. One fruit that comes to mind that has tricked me into thinking that it was good fruit is a plum. You know, I, like, I don't like my plums to be hard. I like my plums to be soft, but not too soft, but, but soft enough where it's tender. The problem is, is that you can eat a really good fruit. When you buy into it, it is perfect. But, but you can also eat fruit that feels good, that looks good, but when you bite into it, it is rotten. Many people have bitten into a rotten fruit and didn't realize the effects until a later time. You bit into it, you internalized it, you ate it, you consumed it. You didn't think that it would do much to you. It didn't impact you. You push it to the side. You blew it off. You carried on with your life. But somewhere down the path of your life, it caught up to you. Something took place that triggered you. And when you got triggered, something came out. Something that you saw. Something that you witnessed. And whatever was in the inside that has been internalized for weeks, months, years, came out to the surface. Yesterday I was at a... Yesterday, I was at a peace march. Our Northwest campus created a peace march, and I was invited to be able to march and to share a few words. As I was at this setting, they had started at a funeral home. From the funeral home, we marched over to the church. As I'm standing in front of this funeral home, as we're Speaking about violence and the goal in mind is to pray against the violence and bringing healing to those who have been victimized because of violence. It hit me that the funeral I'm standing in front of was the very funeral that we, have a, we had a service for my brother. When they asked us to march, we went on the street on the verse for those of you who are familiar, Casey's on diversity. We, we went on to the street and it hit me. This was the very street, the very pathway that a nine-year-old boy witnessed his mother ahead of him walking towards Casey's funeral. Knees buckled in the middle of the street about to collapse where men had to come alongside of her, catch her, and literally carry her into the funeral home. A vivid memory of what I went through at that very moment. A moment of hardship. A moment where it was much very difficult. I didn't realize that what happened then, 34 years later, this moment triggered an emotion and a feeling that I could not put into words. As I made my way over to the funeral home, I am now preparing to share a few words of comfort. As I grabbed the mic, I couldn't even speak. I was so emotional. I need you to keep in mind that this is 34 years removed from the death of my brother. This is not something that happened yesterday or a month ago or a year ago. It's not fresh in, in, in the terms of time. But it was a moment that I was not prepared for. An emotion I have not felt in such a long time. That in that very essence, as I was starting to share, I broke down crying. And I had to find the strength to muster up some words because... I was broken on the inside. What happened to myself, what happened 
to my family was very difficult. And 34 years later, it is still difficult to process. It is difficult to go through. I want to take you to uh, just to, to the next step here as I, as I walk you through this journey. The, the most deadliest snake is called a soul-scaled viper. A soul-scaled viper. According to USA Today, and I quote, when the viper strikes its venom, it's lethal. And scientists believe it to be responsible for more human deaths than all other snake species combined. Its venom, however, is lethal in less than 10% of untreated uh, victims. Listen to this. In other words, if it is untreated, it has the potential to kill you. How many of us are walking around with bites? Venom in our veins killing us slowly. Years later, it's coming out and you're trying to figure out why, why is this coming out now? This, this happened when I was a child. This, this happened with, uh, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And you're trying to tell yourself, why are these bites affecting me now? We have been bitten by the consequences of sin. Bitten from abuse, bitten from rejection, from sin, and we want to heal, but we just don't know how. How do we heal from rejection? My dad walked out of me. I don't even know the, my, na my dad's name. Never met him. Never met my mom. Why do I feel so alone? Bit by life. Why doesn't anybody love me? Why do I feel this way? Why doesn't the church community accept me? We have been bitten by the consequences of, of all of this life. And all of this pain. And we want to heal. But many of us just don't know how. Let me take you back to the parking lot. As I was there, I had a moment of processing. David, are you healed from this? Like, are you truly healed from this? Now, this is my context. But for those of you who are suffering for whatever reason or grieving for whatever reason, I want you to put your context in play. Am I healed from this? So I had to do a, a soul search. I had to process this more than I thought or more than I expected. And the Holy Spirit started to minister to me. Because I believe that many of us, when we think about healing, we have the wrong conception or, 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 or we have the wrong idea of what healing is supposed to look like. And what healing is supposed to feel like. Many of us believe that if we are healed because we no longer feel the pain or we feel the sorrow. So, 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 so healing equates to no pain and no sorrow. I'm here to tell you that is not true. You can be broken and yet healed. You can be in tears and yet healed. You can be sad and yet healed. You can be grieving and mourning and yet healed. So, so, so as I process this journey, I ask the Lord, Lord, how can I define my healing? And the question that I asked myself was, well, David, did you forgive the one that killed your brother? Did you forgive the sins of the one that broke you? And the answer to that was, yes. I have crossed that bridge of forgiveness. How do you know that you are healed? 
You know that you are healed because the one that afflicted you, the one that sinned against you, the one that caused you pain, the one that hurt you, betrayed you, abused you, the one that did that to you no longer controls you. They no longer control you. I can think about the one that killed my brother and to God be my witness, I pray that he comes to know Jesus. I pray that God blesses him. I pray that he flourishes with a great family and I pray blessings over his children. I pray what happened to us does not happen to him. I pray God's provision and God's protection. I pray God's guidance. And if my brother is not saved today, I pray for his salvation. I do not pray revenge against him. I do not pray hell against him. I pray healing to his soul. That's how you know that you are healed. And I'm here to tell you that healing is a process. And it brought me great comfort to know it's okay for you to be sad and yet know that you're healed. It's okay for you to shed tears 5, 10, 15, 20. It's okay that you got to go back and cross some bridges so that you can bring healing to the trauma that you have faced in your life. In Numbers chapter 21, we have the people of Israel who were bitten from the abuse of Pharaoh. God delivered them. He delivered them from slavery for 430 years. But the residue of their bites, their experience, the pain, the confusion, the suffering, it came out in their journey. Moments when they did not have, when they lacked, it came out. It came out of their character. It, it came out in words. It came out in behavior. And the Bible says the people began to speak against God and Moses complaining about the struggle of no food and water, which is a lie. It wasn't the fact that they had no food and no water. It was simply because they did not want what God had supplied for them. They suggested that life was much better with Pharaoh in Egypt than with God in the wilderness. And how many times have we gone to that place where we have suggested to God, it is better to be in Egypt than it is to be in the wilderness. Can I tell you something? That Egypt, the presence of God has been lifted, but in the wilderness, the presence of God is there. So the question is, no matter where you face yourself in your life, do you want the presence of God with you or not? Because when we talk about death we're talking about the absence of God's presence we're talking about God no longer in the mist we know that God is omnipresent but I'm talking about the pillar of crowd cloud I'm talking about the 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 the, the presence of God where he is with you and he is guiding you and he is in you their complaint wasn't the, the absence of food, but, but it, was, it was the lack of variety. God, I'm tired of manna. I'm tired of manna. In other words, they were sick of manna and the lack of water. They thought that at this point, they would have the promise of milk and honey. They thought that they would have already been in the riches. They would have already been in good soil that they can produce and that they can feed and they can do. And yet they find themselves in the wilderness. What they forgot was just a chapter before Moses struck the rock and water gushed out of it. They, they have experienced manna. When they first walked out of the hands of Pharaoh. And the Bible says that bread literally came down from heaven. Because they complained the first time. That there was no food. And it was better in Egypt than it was in the wilderness. 
the miracle of God's provision in the wilderness were evident through their journey. Don't you forget the hand of God in your wilderness. Many of us, we want the promise, but baby, you got to go through the wilderness before you gain the promise. God's hand supernaturally had provided and protected to the point where Israel, where God split the Red Sea and killed their enemies, and yet the wounds of their soul had not yet healed. Have the wounds of your Egypt experience healed yet? Has it healed yet? Ha -ha have you allowed God to truly walk you through the steps so that you are not captivated in Egypt when God is trying to open a door for you to go from the wilderness to the promise? Unhealed wounds does not give you and I permission to sin. And I believe that sometimes we feel entitled. If this happened to me, then it's okay. It gives me the license to sin. No, it does not give you the license to sin. It doesn't give you the license to hate. It doesn't give you the license to send people to hell. It doesn't give you the license to be unkind. It doesn't give you the license to be impatient. It doesn't give you the license to cuss people out. It doesn't give you the license to hate people. It doesn't give you the license to be rude to people. At this stage in their journey, you would have thought that there has been some healing from their suffering. And stronger faith from the miracles of God. But yet what you find is the moment life gets tough, they reverted back. Back to their old ways. Let me tell you the biggest misconception Christians have. It is thinking that when we come to Jesus, we are saved from wickedness. All I got to do is get saved by Jesus and I'm going to be spared from wickedness. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 45, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and the unjust. The good and the evil. God sends the rain to the good. And to the eve, this is Jesus preaching, and it's in its context. Jesus gives a countercultural command to love your enemies. But love is a character of God. You see the difference between the professional liar and God. That love is the character of God, and He shows us that He doesn't just express His character to believers. So you are not only supposed to be kind to those you love, to those who are in Christ, but you're also are called to love those that have sinned against you. In defense to his statement, he explains that when the sun rises, it, it happens to both good and the evil. And when it rains, the rain falls on both the just and the unjust. Even for us who are in ministry, we're not exempt from the wickedness of this world. My dad was a pastor of this church for many years. The, it, the, 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 the death of my brother was not because of the sins of my father. It's because we live in a fallen world. And guess what? The saved and the unsaved would face hardship. The saved and unsaved was, was face sickness. The, the saved and unsaved will, will, will have similar experiences. What does that tell you about God? What that says is how graceful God is. And what that also tells you is how sin has wrecked this world. In those times, farming was a big deal. And Jesus was saying, I don't hold the sun just for the good so that the Christians can benefit 
from the farming and from the crops, crops, anybody who's a farmer is going to benefit from the sun. And when it rains, it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. And you all know what happens with rain, that sometimes rain turns into storms. Too much rain with no sun is just going to drown the seed. Too much sun with no rain is going to dry up the seed. Jesus is simply saying that everyone benefits from him. But just as easily we all benefit from God's grace, we are also confronted with the wickedness that is around us. And for many, we are confronted with what's in us. There are such things as grace before judgment. God is a judge. I need you to understand this. He is a judge and will ju judge us all. But before being a judge, he is displaying mercy and grace. So the simple fact that people who are not saved are succeeding, you ought to clap your hands because you're saying, God, thank you that they have good health. You may be sick today, and you may be in a challenge and a struggle, and someone else is not sick, and they're healthy. You're like, God, I serve you. Why is it that I'm sick, but they're not? You ought to praise God that they're not sick. Why? Because there's more time for them to get their life right with Jesus. I'm not saying that you're, not, that, that you're okay with, with what's happening in your life. I'm not saying that, that you don't pray for God's mercy to bring healing upon your body. We serve a God that is a supernatural God that with one touch, he can bring healing to your soul and healing to your body. But just look at how wonderful our God is. So instead of you getting mad at people who do not have a relationship with God, and people in government that are, pot, that are passing policies that are not biblical. And people who are, who are cheering on what is not biblical. Don't get mad at them. They don't know Jesus. The ones that we need to have a conversation with is those that declare that they know Jesus. But the, the, those that don't know Jesus, why are you so mad that they're living in their sin? Why do we get offended that they're living in their sin? Don't talk at them. Talk with them. Talk with them. Because deep down inside, if you have a conversation with them, they would open up to you. This, this, this very scripture in John, reference to the enemy, is Jesus speaking to Zacchaeus? When he speaks of the just and the unjust, he's speaking to Zacchaeus. He's having a one on one conversation where others would not dare be in his presence. God said, He's alive and I love him. The religious people don't accept him because he's one of them. And they think that they're holier than thou, but even their religion has blinded them. God is a God of grace and mercy. It's so big, I think sometimes we forget how big it is. We, 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 we live in, in this fallen world that the consequence of man's sin has, yes, it has affected us all. And like you, I grieve over the violence that is happening in our city. I spoke to the commander of the 25th on yesterday and just talking about how the, 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 the violence is, is, is taking its course. And I asked him, I said, where is this coming from? And who is committing these crimes? And all of these court thefts and house break-ins. And this is what he tells me, he says, Pastor, it's the teenagers. We're losing a generation where we're talking at them but not with them. And we talk as if our generation is much better than their generation. And if you would have done it our way, but we got to pause for a moment, 
We're the ones that raise these babies. In church, if they're lacking a mom or a dad or there is a dysfunction in their home, who do you think needs to step in? It is the church of Jesus Christ to bring hope into these young babies that are growing up thinking, I got to survive. We live in a fallen world. Disobedience to God has hurt a lot of people, including Christians. And Christians, we are not exempt from the wickedness of this world. And we would also suffer the consequences of our sins. And I got to confess to you, because of my sin, I have hurt people. Because of other people's sin, I have been hurt. Christians don't escape the pains of this world. And we don't escape the consequences of sin. Disobedience to God is poison. And this poison, it leads to a place of brokenness. Many of you today, broken. Broken. When the people of Israel spoke against God, the Bible says that God dropped a poisonous snake and it bit people and many died. Consequences of disobeying God. Consequences. Again, before we speak against God, let me remind you that God has already shown His hand in protecting and providing. But we also have to remember, yes, God is mercy. Yes, God is grace. But God is also judge. I believe we do exactly what Israel did, which was this. Israel prayed to the Lord that he may take the serpents from us. God, the serpents, would you please take it away? How many times have you prayed for God to take it away? God, would you please take away this pain? God, would you please take away this problem? But you will learn in many instances that God may not remove the serpent, but he will always make a way for us to overcome the serpent. He would always make a way. The same way that he made a way for Israel when they were on the crossroads of the enemy coming to, to, to kill them. And they had a roadblock of the Red Sea. And the Bible says that God split the Red Sea. But there is a key word that we cannot miss in that scripture. For the Bible says that as Israel began to cross the Red Sea, which was a miracle in itself. Picture yourself in front of Lake Michigan. And as you see Lake Michigan, that God splits it. The Bible says this, that the ground they walked on was dry. Which means that when God paves a way, he always makes sure that the ground you stand on is strong enough for you to hold you up. It is strong enough to hold you up. And listen to me, you may be crossing that Red Sea bleeding. You may be crossing that Red Sea with a heavy heart. But the fact that you are crossing it with a foundation and with God, here's the thing. God most times will not take it away from you. But what God will do is that he will walk with you. And it is God with you that would carry you through whatever has bitten you. The presence of the serpent is not the problem. Your proximity to the serpent is. So the only way you would get bit depends on how close you are to the serpent. And the hearts of Israel were so removed from God that they pressed the default button. They told themselves it is much better to be in Egypt than it is to be in the wilderness. But God didn't remove the serpent. But because Israel acknowledged their sin, God told Moses to build a bronze snake and to put it on a stick and lift it up high. And whenever they look at this snake, they will be healed. Just because we repent 
doesn't mean our troubles will go away. But God has designed an anti-venom to bring healing to our soul. The Bible says in John 3, 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up high, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. This is making reference to Jesus Christ on the cross. That He who is lifted up, he who is lifted up, the Bible says that all men will be drawn unto him. That he who is lifted up on that cross, that cross symbolizes, yes, yes, it symbolizes death. But I'm here to tell you it also symbolizes life. That on that cross he took all of our grief and all of our pain and all of our sorrow. And he took it so that we can have a life that is free. And the bronze, it represents judgment. And early on before Jesus' death and the resurrection, the brazen altar was a place for animal sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. The bronze laver, remember this, was to clean your hands from the sacrifice as it symbolizes one's purity. It was both bronze. In reference to Numbers 21, I'm bringing a closure, to simply remove the snakes will be to remove all judgment rather the judgment is lifted up that the sinner might agree with God repent and be healed so God said on this cross I'm going to take on your curse let all of your judgment be on me years ago scientists were looking for an anti-venom to heal from poisonous snake bites so they will use horse blood since they are big and hold a lot of blood as they continue to experiment they discovered listen to this that the blood of a lamb is much better at fighting the venom for those of you who are not churchy let me explain this to you John the Baptist said these very words. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He wasn't making a reference to an animal. He was making reference to Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, in Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. There is redemption. And you can be redeemed by Him. I want you to stand to your feet. You can be redeemed. You can be renewed. No matter what you need to be redeemed by, God can redeem you. Here, here is where I wanted to start. The very reason why Jesus came to earth was this, to save us from our sins. And if you're in this place today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus... And you have been bitten by life. Or maybe you're a prodigal and you have run from God and you have been bitten by life. I want to tell you that salvation is knocking at your door. That Jesus is knocking at your door and he is asking of you, do you want to open? And do you want to let me in? This is the message of Jesus. And though you and I may go through much... There is no greater decision than to make that in which Jesus is not only your Lord, but he's also your Savior. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're in this room today and you're saying, Pastor D, would you pray for me? I want a relationship with Jesus. Pastor D, would you pray for me? I am that prodigal. I've run from Jesus, but I'm ready to return. 
I'm here to tell you that God would remove that shame from you. God would heal you. But you got to respond and open that door. All you got to do is believe in Jesus at this very moment. That's your first step. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the death of Jesus for the sake of my sins. And I believe in the resurrection of Jesus for conquering my sins. He is God. He is Lord. If you believe that, would you lift up your hands right where you are? I believe that salvation would knock at your door. I'm here to tell you that we're coming against a professional liar. And a professional liar who is our adversary will convince you that you're saved when you're really not saved. And today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. If that is you, I believe there's more hands that is in this place. And I'm taking my time because this is why we do what we do right here. May the word of God penetrate your heart. This is not by chance. Or by accident, listen to me and listen to me clear. Your abuse was not God's fault. But God says, all ye who are broken hearted, come to me. And I, Jesus, I'll give you rest. If you're in this place today, lift up your hands. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. If you're watching online, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I don't care how old and I don't care how young you are. I believe that the Spirit of God right now is ministering into your heart. He wants to heal you. He wants to heal you. And you can't do this without Him. With every strength that you got, would you do me a favor? Would you come out of your seat? Would you make your way up here to this altar? New life, let's clap our hands for every person who has the courage to come out of their seat and come up here to this altar. They're coming. They're coming.